Okay, guys, uh, we're going to get started. It's the last presentation. It is uh, Anthony Volodkin from Hype Machine. Um, he's actually wearing a Last FM shirt, so don't get confused. They're kind of doing a, a, a group love thing here on stage. It's really cool. Um, and then we've got Hannah Donovan, uh, who is uh, the design director uh, for uh, Last FM. Uh, and I'll let them start. Hey, it's good to be here. I'm Anthony, and I've, I'm the founder of Hype Machine. Hype Machine is a music site that keeps track of what, people, what music people blog about, and it aggregates it all together in one neat list, and you get to find out what, what is currently hot on any given day in the community of blogs. Hi, I'm Hannah, and um, I think that you guys now know what Last.fm does. If you listen to Matt Ogle's talk, I work with these two lovely gentlemen over here at Last.fm, and I'm the creative director there. So um, today we're going to talk about something. Um, I, I, to give you some background, Anthony approached me about this topic, and he was like, you know, I want to talk about the effects of style on music websites. And I was like, OK, cool, but murky. This could be, <laughs> this could be dangerous. It's something that is really fun to talk about, but it's, it's dangerous to talk about because it's the thing that I think elicits the most visceral response from users when they're looking at your website. So we decided to dive into this murky territory today, and I hope that you guys have lots of um, questions and, and criticism at the end of our presentation. So the reason we wanted to talk about style is we feel like this is sort of given the least consideration in the design process when it comes to music websites. Um, we all know how much work it is to put, together a to put together a website, how much thinking goes into the product and the user experience and the interaction design and what content are you going to put there and how are you going to write the copy and often I think visual design is the thing that maybe gets considered last or maybe runs out of time for consideration. Um, so that's why we want to talk about that today. So let's just start out with some um, definitions of what we mean by style for the context of this presentation today. So style is a distinctive appearance or aesthetic, and it's typically determined by the principles according to which something is designed. So by principles, I mean the way that you're going to design this thing. So if you're designing a building, if you're an architect, there's certain principles you have to follow. If you're designing a website, there's certain principles you have to follow etc. goes on. Um, we're going to talk about these principles in a second. Also, I think it's important to mention right up front here that style is subjective. So what this means is that it's totally based on your opinion of something and the way one person sees it is not going to be the way someone else sees it. And that's why this is a dangerous topic. That's why it's murky and scary to talk about because what makes one person go, ooh, is going to potentially make another person go, ugh. So, but nonetheless, this is the thing that elicits the most visceral response when you put a website in front of a user. And I, I think for that reason, it's worth talking about. Um, also, if any of you guys work on websites that have any kind of user feedback, you'll know that because your users have eyeballs, they feel like they're entitled to comment on the visual design of your website. <laughs> Sometimes they won't always comment on how it's coded, but they will always comment on the way it looks. So just to follow up on this subjective comment, um, good art doesn't match your sofa. I don't know if anyone's heard this line before, but what this basically means is that it is subjective and what makes art good, and that's in scare quotes because, of course, good is subjective. Um, it might not be match your tastes or your opinion. If you were to buy a Picasso and put it in your living room, you would not expect it to match your sofa. So what this means is when you're looking at a website, just because you like the color blue and you think that this looks awesome for what you like to look at on your screen, doesn't necessarily mean that it would work well for your users. And this is a really important thing to, to keep in mind and keep in check. Um, it's something that designers are trained to do. Um, but it's important because, it, like I said, it elicits a, visual, a visceral response like that. And when you look at your website, you're going to want to like it, but you need to think about how your users are going to like it more than how you like it. Um, I really like thinking about design along these lines, that a designer is a planner with an aesthetic sense. So I'm going to talk about some design principles in a minute, and you can keep this in mind when we talk about those principles, because it is mainly about planning things and problem solving, but there is definitely an element of aesthetics in there that is 
very critical to what you're doing. So bearing this in mind, I'm going to just quickly walk you through some iconic examples of style just to kind of set the stage visually for what we're talking about. So here's four examples. Um, but these images are so iconic that they, they have style to the point that they're iconic. So I would call these stylized. We all can kind of reference these images quickly and easily. We know what they are. Um, you know, we've got an iconic album cover, original Apple computer, noir, and, uh, and, a, and a scene there from, from um, a well-known film. Now imagine that how silly Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey would be in a noir comic style. Or for instance, how ridiculous the typography of the Mac Plus diagram would look on the Place of Nirvana's album cover, for instance. And so this gives you a good frame of reference to consider how style can be um, used as a visual shorthand for what you're trying to message to your users and that in a way that could be misplaced, it can be kind of dangerous or have unexpected outcomes. So getting back to those principles, I'm gonna get really theoretical on you for a second. Um, these are not principles that, you know, are necessarily true, but they're principles that I work by, so that's why I'm calling them possible principles. A lot of other designers might agree with these or might do them slightly their own way. For instance, some people add information design as one of these categories, but loosely, I think we can all kind of agree that you need at least these five. So the first one is user experience design. Simply put, what does your user need and what do they want? So what's your use case? What problem are you solving? If you're not trying to solve a problem, then you're not going to make a design. There's no reason to do it in the first place. Secondly, what are your limitations? So things like time, budget, resources, constraints. Designers always work inside constraints. If you don't have constraints, I think that then you're sort of creating something that's more in the realm of art than design because problem solving is always has limitations around it. Interaction design. So this is not to be confused with the user experience design. Interaction design is how it feels. So what happens when you click a button? Where, what is the next page that you go to? What does the user flow feel like? What happens, how does the user get from A to B? So based on what they want, how do they actually get it done? And then fourthly, the content. So this is everything from infographics to message, tone, copy, photographs, that kind of stuff. What kind of content are you working with? Is it editorial? Is it user-generated content? Do you have to deal with translation? That kind of thing. And then lastly, the visual design, how it looks. So when you put all these things together, you wrap it up in a nice package, what are users going to see when they hit that page for the very first time? So those are the principles um, that we're going to be referencing in this talk. Now, here's some possible misconceptions, um, because I do see people using these principles a lot, um, but maybe not always in a holistic fashion, I guess I could say. So, I think one misconception is that you don't need to consider them all, which can be really dangerous, and we have some examples to show you of that later on. You do definitely need to consider them all. They're all incredibly important, and they need to be considered holistically. Also, they need to be considered together. You can't do this separately and fuse it together later, and it always kind of sends shivers up my spine when I hear people talking about like, oh, we'll just outsource the visual design, or we'll write the copy, and then we'll send it over to the designer later, where these people aren't actually talking to each other or being in the same room or working on things in a holistic fashion. The same way you would never try to create a product with a designer and a developer maybe not talking to each other, you also wouldn't do that with two designers. So it, they need to be done together. And also, um, lastly, I think this is probably the most common case because we often execute them in that order. You don't have to, but we often do. You think about the user experience first and then you think about the interaction design then you put the visuals on. I think we've all been through that process. Um, it's not necessarily an order of importance. And also, it means that we need to save enough time at the end to actually give the visuals the time that they deserve. So this is why we need to spend time on this. Style matters so much that all of you in here today are willing to pay cash monies for it. So what you're wearing, what you own, all of these laptops, this is style. You guys pay for this stuff. I mean, why do we buy Apple computers, Bang & Olufsen speakers, a Wii, a Leica camera, all of these things are not only just well designed because they fit our use case and they do what we want them to do, but also they feel good. They feel awesome to hold, they work well, they're shiny, they feel nice in your hands, 
And they're a part of our personal style. We want to have these objects so that when people look at us or interpret us, that's what they're seeing. And this is probably, again, in the murky territory. I think this is another reason why this is a hard topic to talk about, because style is really unmeasurable, except for what I would call the ooh metric. So what do people say when they visit your website? Is it a ooh, you know, like how does this, how does this feel? Um, or as Anthony pointed out earlier to me, sometimes it's a metric unrelated to style. So actually you might see that your page views go up and it might be because you changed the visual design, but it would be an unrelated metric that you're testing there. So style is the first thing that people see. Even if you spend weeks considering your use cases, I would put money on the fact that when users load your website for the first time, they are first going to notice what color it is over what the use cases are. Um, and I think that's why we need to talk about how important this is. However, with all that sort of waxing positive about style, I just want to <laughs> quickly put a disclaimer on this that it's really hard to also just impress users with style alone. That would be empty and it would be foolish. And actually at Last.fm we have a house rule that we don't release new visuals without any new functionality. And the reason for this is because the aesthetics are based on those principles that we talked about, it helps the users to understand why the visuals look the way they do if they can see the feature behind it. When they see the feature, they understand the user experience, they understand the interaction design, there's some transparency and holistic thinking that they can understand and it makes more sense why the visuals look the way they do. If you just release the visuals without any of that feature to back it up, it's really unclear to users why you made this change and it's going to feel like you're actively disrupting something in their environment. Like, why did you just make my website blue today? What the fuck? I didn't want this, right? So I think for that reason it's important that you release them at the same time. So now I'm going to hand it over to Anthony who's going to show you some examples of what we just talked about. So more specifically, I'm going to first talk about what happens more typically, which is that uh, where people don't consider the things we've just discussed or apply maybe a few of them here and there. And um, there, there, there are some really interesting results when that happens. So the first thing we're looking at, this is uh, a site called You Play Me. It's a music startup from New York. At some point it was uh, kind of like a last FM plus dating site. So you would uh, scrabble things you listen to and then find dates based on that. Recently they've switched their focus and now it's really all about uh, being able to sort of scrabble everything you consume. So that's, you know, uh, anything you listen to, everything you watch, all in one place, effortlessly and collected with your friends. Um, now that sounds kind of like a pretty cool app and um, the question is what do you see when the, when the, what do you see on the front page as soon as you load, as soon as you go to their site? And you know, some smart people probably told them that, well, you should convert users into the users that download your app and install this plugin for Firefox or you know, for your Mac or PC that actually tracks all this usage. So fair enough. But you look at this and the instant reaction looking at the, the color is that this is kind of creepy. I don't know if I want these guys to track my usage in this way. In fact, watching me watch videos by them is kind of scary. Um, and you know this, this page doesn't even make, make, make it clear what really happens with all this um, content in the first place. They do offer a way to click and see it in action, but that is just a static profile that is used as a demo, which still kind of makes the benefits really not, not obvious. So this is where the visuals don't fit the user experience or the, the, the mission of what they're trying to do. Because uh, if you're collecting people's personal information, and especially something like, you know, that's, um, very personal, like what music and what videos you watch, um, you really want to create an atmosphere of trust. Um, that, I mean, that's I think what Last.fm does very well with the way they, um, with, it, with, the, with the way they're transparent about their open source scrambling software and um, the way they um, also just are very straight with what happens with your data. So um, there are many more examples like this though. And um, this is another site called Mog. This is based in San Francisco as well, and it is um, it is a blogging it's, it's a music blogging community that invites you to create your own blog and write your thoughts about songs, upload songs, and other users can find your blog posts and listen to them. Um, it's sort of like a hype machine platform in a sense. Um, and the issue here is definitely um, the, the visual responses we talked about um, with whoever who was designing this. They kind of overrode everything they're trying to accomplish on the site. So. 
this site is supposed to invite people to share about any kind of music they like, but the style that it presents overrides that so much that the only people that end up sticking around are, um, so it's not immediately obvious to share, but if you, if you um, browse the site a little more, you start noticing that people are typically older, um, they're not the young, engaged music fans that you sort of expect on a platform like this, and then once you think a little more about, if you look at this color, it all suddenly becomes clear, because I don't actually think I'd want to blog on something that looks like this. Um, in fact, though, once you do sign up, there are all kinds of ways to really customize how your profile looks, but the problem, I think, is that people don't actually get to that step, or they don't ever get to discover that. Another site, this is based in New Jersey in the States. This is a new startup that kind of merges uh, Twitter and Last.fm in this real-time way of sharing what you're listening to, but not in an automated way like Last.fm. So you actually type out the song you're checking out and then like it posts it in this kind of tweet thing. But here, I think this is a good example of uh, design process being fully disconnected from the product. So looking at this, in fact, if I didn't tell you what it does, I don't think you'd know. Um, this, this, this style doesn't communi really communicate much about music, except that I think in the corner, if There's you look a carefully. There's creepy Michael Jackson head looking at you. Do you see it? It's, it's a tribute to Michael Jackson <laughs> right in the corner. I'm not, not quite sure why that's there, but um, basically it's very clear that these guys haven't thought very carefully about how to connect what they're trying to do <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with the design. Uh, so th that's bad. Don't do this. Um, now, the, here's a product that I actually really like. This is incredible. This is uh, 14 tracks every week. They pick 14 usually electronic tracks that are um, connected together by some theme. And you can download them all together at a discounted rate for like six pounds. Um, it is actually usually very esoteric, a very esoteric music selection. So as far as music discovery, it, I, I found fewer things that have gotten me to spend as, as much money as these guys. Now, that said, that completely is unobvious if you look at the way that this is laid out. This looks more like a, some kind of kids' summer festival ad rather than um, a music site that actually that has a lot of really uh, unique selections. And I mean, part of that has to do with just the sort of clip party nature of what they've selected. And again, this is, I think, a f an example of where um, the product design is fully disconnected from the, the visual design. Uh, because, I mean, sure, this looks really nice. It's actually very neat and consistent. If you look, I mean, all the icons are consistent, but they're consistent in failing to communicate what the real value of this is. Um, so, so pe pe this, is some, some, this, this message is not lost on everyone. Some people are aware that, um, you know, overstyling something or styling something incorrectly could lead to really dangerous results and, you know, potentially total failure. Um, <laughs> So the, 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 the other camp um, starts to think, well, um, let's, if, if we can't, if, we were, if we're scared of styling something, let's just do it in an unstyled way where, um, you know, we'll be more connected to something like Flickr, which I think is one of the sites that probably is the most notable example of like a very lightly styled Web 2.0 site that has become an icon for, uh, I mean, inspire a ton of other sites. Um, the difference being, though, that it is a photo site, so the focus is, are the photos that people are looking at. And so it's um, much easier to do on a photo site than on a music site, where oftentimes there's a very limited amount of graphics and visual work available to you. So if you fully unstyle what you're doing with music, well, you don't actually have a whole lot left to show to people. So this is Django. This is actually a fairly large US-based Pandora-like site where you know it kind of plays you similar radio based on like on artists you enter. I mean, it's really like the idea of kind of Last of Femme and Pandora boiled down to something quite bland. And um, the reason it's bland is because the, the, their fear of styling it in any way just doesn't communicate um, music-wise. So an another large site that has attempted to, do, to, to play in the same space as I like. And, um, I like is another example, probably a closer example of something like Flickr in terms of style, where um, it is incredibly clean. And you know, if, if I didn't tell you, I don't think you'd know that you're looking at a Muse artist page. So um, the only way you can tell, I think it says that there's, there's a tab that says artists and it says Muse, but really there's so little about the artists and all the other artist pages look exactly like this, revealing 
nearly nothing about the character of the music or, um, or really any other aesthetical element whatsoever about an artist. So it's quite sterile, it feels like this is dead and empty. Um, it, it is, however, friendly. The colors are pretty positive, but um, yeah, that, that's, only, that's only part of the process. Again, this, the, the, the consequence that these, these guys are not considering when um, the design process isn't connected to what they want to accomplish with the product is that um, it kind of hides the complexity of music. So I'd, I'd hope that there's more to Muse than a little box with art in the corner. Um, and some of this is not necessarily comes from fear of, of over designing or designing in, in, incorrectly in, or in an unfitting way. It also comes uh, as a result as a re reaction to something like MySpace, where um, the design is often so overwhelming that people have traditionally thought that as you know as a messy environment where um, where the lack of consistency turns them off to the user experience. When in fact the re the reality is that. It's, it's a good tool for a lot of artists to express their particular visual aesthetics and connect it to the way that they want to present their music. Now, so they're, they're, this, is, this is Verb. Verb is a, a company some of you may not have heard of. It started around the same time as MySpace or maybe a little bit afterwards. And um, it was meant to be an artist's home on the web. And um, part of the, re the, the reactionary bit in it is that it's, it's incredibly clean and um, in the earlier version of the site, there's even a button on every single page that would remove all styles from the page you're looking at. So that's again to disconnect music and expression with the presentation. That's the that's that's the bit that, that is the disconnected bit in this case. Um, but s styling is not all so bad, and some people actually do get it right. Uh, but even then, it's really important to consider what it is that your site or your project wants to be when it grows up and it grows past an audi like a limited audience of early adopters. So this is a site called Superglued and it's, it invites you to make a list of shows you've either been to or will go to. And it kind of keeps your own uh, gigography of, of shows you like and it, it gets you to um, upload photos of them and share all kinds of wonderful social things. And in this case, the style actually fits very well because, I mean, most likely people that do this are indie fans and um, people that are quite young and they're probably engaged with web and music on some degree. And um, this really, this design really makes sense for them. However, they uh, one day will probably want to reach people that uh, are maybe older, maybe they're into hip hop. Um, I think if I was more into hip hop, I don't think I'd use this. And but I think, that, and there are many other groups to whom this particular style doesn't make sense. And you know, that's all fine if that's what these guys mean to be. But if they want to reach a larger audience, this is an unconsidered issue that one day they'll wake up and they're like, man, why are only indie kids using our site? Where, where's everyone else? And, and this, this, this is why. Um, this problem, of course, doesn't only connect with smaller sites. I mean, this is a site I think most of you know very intimately. And it started, um, it started off with a, a, a big core group of, you know, basically the, the early adopters of the site were uh, a, lot, a lot of electronic musicians. And actually, in fact, uh, the creators of SoundCloud also are electronic musicians to some degree. And um, that led to the, cre the site being created in a very cohesive way where it really connects with what matters to an electronic music fan. So I'm, I'm actually not sure if it's visible, but. When most pages, the, the BPMs of the tracks are displayed and um, the waveform is, 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 is present in all of the different uh, places where you would play a track. Now, this is great, but um, again, if you're trying to build a community that is focused on electronic music, this is, this is wonderful, but if you're trying to expand into other areas, I mean, I think uh, indie, rock, indie rockers probably don't care what their waveform looks like and uh, will just be confused as to why that's on every single player everywhere. And, you know, Hype Machine actually has this issue as well, where um, as part of, while working on it, we, at some, a few years ago, launched a redesign that involved a lot more, like a lot more noticeable and heavier branding. And um, what we've done connects really well with indie bloggers. And it connects very well with the, the kind of in, music bloggers write about. Because over time, we noticed that despite our efforts to be um, a really eclectic platform for, you know, for, for collecting and gathering um, blog data, it turned out that most, there, there, certain people are much more likely to blog about music than others. And most people, the, most of those people are 
you know, people in their early 20s that uh, are fairly affluent and they, um, they like indie music. So we have the same issue and in our case it all, it all fits because um, we can only grow as far as the blogger community grows. So if, if one day um, music, blog becomes, music blogging becomes a lot more commonplace, we'll be able to alter our identity to fit that in an appropriate way. Um, another good example of where the identity fits well with the target of in, the target in the audience is a site called Zero Inch. This is a electronic music store from Berlin, and you probably could tell that actually without me telling you that. Um, <laughs> th there's just there's just a lot going on there, uh, and um, there's also a really great interface for when you buy tracks. There are also I think some waveforms somewhere in there, and um, it, it, it's a pretty unique looking interface, and that is all connected to their, fo their explicit focus on electronic music. Cool, so um, yeah, as Anthony just mentioned, you know, one way to get around this problem of how do we deal with the styling is just actually let the style speak for the music itself. And I think a great example of this is MySpace. Um, so this is a, a MySpace uh, music page for Beirut and um, this is, just, this is just lovely. I mean, it really conveys a lot about Beirut's music. I mean, yes, MySpace might not have had the most stellar interaction design in its heyday. Um, you know, it was a bit clunky to use and maybe a bit difficult to get around and search things, but this is a really wonderful platform for people to express themselves on. And more importantly, what I think is really interesting about this is that it really clearly communicates that there's people here. It feels really alive and it feels messy. It feels like music is. Like music and people are messy, messy things. And this in contrast to one of those screenshots of Verb that we showed you earlier, um, I think really shows how this gets that point across where Verb wasn't because that just feels like an empty, kind of cold, almost untouchable, like I don't want to go in there, where's the people kind of website. Um, also this is, I just think this is so captivating and engaging and clearly it was because we've all seen the stats on MySpace. Um, but also because the designer is the conduit for connecting the public with aesthetics. I really feel that this is art of our day, like if that's what a designer does is that they try to get their visuals out to a mass market the same way a designer for Ikea might try to get their visuals to a mass market. This is what they're doing here and this is a fantastic way for designers today to actually connect with their public. Um, another example is, you know, the way um, Storm Thurgeson was connecting with the psychedelic movement of the 60s with his album covers back then. This is the same thing that's happening and I, I think this is a great example of that. So there's freedom for expression for the artist and high engagement from the user. Um, this is pretty cool. However, on the flip side of this coin, um, we've got something like Last FM. So at Last FM, we took a different approach, um, which was let's not let everyone customize everything, but let's try to maintain sort of a genre agnostic approach. And the reason that we do this um, is probably, as you can guess from Matt's talk earlier, is that we um, just try to sort of connect people with their music and we don't editorialize anything. Everything comes from your personal listening history. It's all based on the data, so it just wouldn't make sense for what we do. Um, but this is where I think we can have a difference between style and stylized. So where something like the Beirut page on MySpace is very stylized, it feels like indie electronic music, it feels like that Beirut concept. Um, on Last FM, it's still style, like th there's design here, but it's not stylized. We haven't done something so iconic that it connects with a certain type of music, hopefully, <laughs> that would turn some people off from using it. So we are trying to be more broad in our approach of who we can, who would be using the website. Um, the way that we do this with visuals is primarily through our artist images. Um, so this is a screenshot a little further down on your personal homepage. So it might not make so much sense to you guys, but to me, this makes sense because this is the music that I'm into. So when I come here, this is the music that I like to see. Um, now, for the anonymous user, of course, we have to take a different approach, and so generally we use our popular artist data to sort of populate those pages, um, which is cool, but it's also, there is a little bit of a, a pitfall there, I think, because it's, it's cyclical in that it's self-reinforcing, so if we have a lot of indie music listeners, then indie music will show up on our homepage and so on. However, if the demographics shift slightly, at least we are powering it by data so that the visuals can shift as well. Um, 
Right, so just a quick little story on style versus stylized. Uh, this is a Last FM <laughs> screenshot from um, 2006, I think. Yeah, and I think actually the best thing about this screenshot is I don't know if you guys can read at the top, but it says submissions are currently down. Oh, and also Happy New Year. So <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> this just reminds me of the old Last FM days. Um, but so this was actually done by a, d a design firm in London, and they were very soaked up in the sort of London design music scene of the time in 2006, and I think this design really reflects that environment. So that was cool, and you know, it was great for Last FM at the time, and probably great for people that were listening to it in London, but what it wasn't so great for was actually some of our user base in Scandinavia, where they um, have sort of a long-standing tradition of, um, of Gothic metal music there of all descriptions. Um, and you can imagine how these guys reacted to this sort of pinky reddish website. Um, so w in subsequent redesigns we did, so this is what the Last of Them website looks like now, we did this paint it black color switcher, which I'm sure some of you have noticed. Um, and lots of people ask us about this, like why do you let people sort of mess with your brand and change it to black? And that's exactly the reason why, because we are trying to have style without being too stylized. and actually just the color red can sometimes convey a little bit too much of a stylized notion for people that really don't you know have any color in their musical life at all and so letting them switch it to black is sort of kind of solves this problem what are you guys laughing at <laughs> <laughs> okay um so another 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 approach to this is um is the way songkick are doing it um so again they're trying to be a lot of things to a lot of people and deal with a lot of different kind of gigs and they're you know don't want to pigeonhole themselves and i think this is a nice way of also getting the emotional tone of live music across because of course live music is you know it's different than music recommendations and we're talking about you know standing in a sweaty club listening to a band that you love and that has a whole set of visuals and emotions that goes along with it as well so they use this um this background image here which is which is pretty cool so that's another way around it but again, the visual is, I think, generic enough that it doesn't speak too much to a particular audience. So um, actually, this has become a trend in the live music space. <laughs> um, and we're seeing a bunch of other websites doing this now, too, which is cool, because um, trends, like I said earlier, are shorthand, or sort of a, it's a visual shorthand for communicating something to your users. Like when I say bubbly typography and gradients and drop shadows, you guys think Web 2.0, right? But what that actually is, is it's a visual shorthand for this website has social stuff in it. And so I think it's interesting that this is actually becoming a trend in the uh, online event space now that like sort of this picture of, you know, club scene, lights flashing, mic stand is sort of becoming sort of ubiquitous with that. Um, here's yet another example of how another web, another product handles this. So this is iTunes. This is what it looks like when it first starts up on your computer. But what I actually think is a little bit more interesting is this, because that's the way people usually tend to use it, I think. Um, and this is essentially just a, you know, it's your musical spreadsheet. It barely has any visuals in it at all. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't have style. I mean, Apple's got loads of style. This thing looks great. It feels really nice to use. There's, you know, the whole, there's so much detail in this. But um, it's, it's being all things to everyone. And so they've been very restrained and there's absolutely no visuals in this whatsoever except for the album art. So there's a couple examples of how people have been getting around this problem, but I don't think, um, I don't know if anyone's really cracked it successfully yet. It's definitely a hard one, given that music is such a non-visual medium, because it's, you know, an audio, um, and also because when we're trying to be genre agnostic in this way, um, it's hard not to let stylized stuff creep in. So to wrap it up, you know, we, the, the thing that we want to get out is that everyone who's working on a music, and actually mostly any site, has to take an active approach in s making the aesthetics and the style and the user experience and all those things work together in one cohesive ball. So that means don't style in a vacuum. Uh, all your designers, your, your, all the people on the product team have to talk together and not just sit in their rooms and um, think for themselves. And um, that also speaks quite dangerously to outsourcing, where outsourcing your design for the product can lead to a similar problem where someone over there in the 
miles away, comes up with something that looks nice and actually doesn't fit at all with what you're doing. Um, as, far, as, as far as music specifically goes, it is messy just like people. So, and, and you can't really clean it up, you can't really restrict it in a lot of ways. So just let it, let it exist naturally on the web uh, in the way that it's meant to be. So if it's messy, let it be messy. Um, and the, the next bit is, it's, it's really critical. When, and it only, it only counts really for like venture, venture startups or any, any projects that um, want to once, one day attract a mainstream audience. Um, it's really important to know whether that's a product or project you want to be. If you really want to be a niche that's focused on a particular genre or area of usage, then it's good to know that and you can really create a design that fits that. But if you really want to be a mainstream product, then um, there are other considerations to take into account. So just knowing on which side of that road you, you stand is really important. And uh, finally, style can be achieved without looking stylized. Much like Hannah said, um, you can still have a, a strong brand without connecting it to certain visuals that then restrict, how, restrict what people find what you do interesting and turn off some people and turn on, other, turn on others. The problem is that the people that you lose in, this kind of, in the self-selection process you never find out about because they just leave and don't stick around in your site. I think um, we're up for questions now. We don't have one of those fancy questions now slides, so this is the time. <laughs> Hi, my name is Robert. Um, how do you uh, go about uh, trying to um, uh, get your team who is not, who are mostly not designers, on board with design. So how do you get them passionate about it? Do you, do you show them conversion statistics or uh, certain things where they get excited about or do you give them assignments or, or w what do you do to get a non-designer to be passionate about style and design? Well, I mean, one of, it, one of these things goes deeply into just how your team communicates, but another approach you can take is you can really scare them. Basically show them some of the screenshots I shared earlier and tell them that that's what their stuff will look like and that no one will use it and then pe people will, actually it was, it was hard for us to find some of these because the, 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 what happens with those sites is that people don't go to them and so people don't talk about them and the only reason I, I happen to know about them is because I just find, like I find all music sites as part of my, part of my work and some of them are those. So I, I, I definitely scare them and show them what could happen if they don't do it and I think because ultimately the tech, everyone on the team wants it to be the best product possible, I think they will quickly understand that it's not something that they can ignore. Yeah, just to jump in there though, I think there is a little bit of a danger though, going back to the good art doesn't match your sofa slide, that um, designers sometimes end up showing things to developers of course, and developers have a propensity for liking certain things over other things. Um, and I think this is sometimes dangerous because we're not really thinking about who the end user is and whether they're going to like this. I mean, the best way to do it is to just put it in front of someone and see what they think. Like, do you get the ooh metric when they look at it or not? Um, but bearing that in mind, I think that design is also an essential ingredient for sort of motivating the people that you work with. I mean, I think it must be really frustrating just to be coding a product and not have sort of any sexy looking visuals to, you know, pin up on the wall and sort of point to and be like, ah, oh, that's where we're going to be in a couple of weeks. This is awesome. I really want to get there. And I think that's an integral role for the designer within your organization to sort of, to be that motivator and to pull together some interesting visuals throughout the project and, and try to get people on board with them. Well, I think Michael Jackson tribute, like, personally really inspires me. <laughs> so, uh, Hannah, um, half a year ago, I think it was something like that. You guys introduced a new Last FM header, which had grungy brush strokes. Yeah. Then you change it to the, the glossy one. And now, about two weeks ago, I noticed you took, you took out the gloss, right? <laughs> no? No. No, I, I think there. you had some. Yeah, really? No, we only changed it once since the grungy brush strokes. Okay, but, but do you have any words on why you went why from something very characteristic to something like more universal? Sure, I think um, it's part of what Anthony talked about actually, which is consider who you are going to be when you're growing up. I think, um, and also going back to Matt's presentation as well, Last.fm has changed a lot over the years and it's changed because of the music landscape around it and where it started off being sort of this very pinkish looking kind of almost electronic website that was solely music recommendations. It went into this area of being 
we're going to be really entertainment focused and stream music. And then Matt told you about what we did last year. And now we're sort of trying to solidify our brand again and grow up and figure out our place. And so I think that the visuals there, I mean, it, they are connected to the concept behind Last FM and where we're trying to position ourselves and, you know, um, basically what our brand is. So that's, that would be the reason behind that shift there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, there's, there's something I've noticed with, uh, like, emotional self-identification with design style, like the look and feel. Um, in New York, actually, Justin, with Mux Tape, I never use Mux Tape, Tumblr, Vimeo, any of these sites. I kind of feel like I'm looking at sort of one community of designers that have a very similar concept, and, and, it, and it's good. I like it. But it's, and I call it the sort of New York design geek style, and I like it. I personally like it, and some people don't. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's WordPress themes that, you know, the theme developer, theme designer community has really taken off, and it's really built up a lot of popularity around WordPress. And there's a lot of, again, emotional identification. How important is it to just look at, like, you know, if you're going for a certain vibe or a certain community, to look at what else they find popular and to just look at, look at that. I mean, on one sense, you can look at it as aping it, copying it. Yeah. Or at, on one sense, you can just look at it as saying, if this is what they truly like and this is the user experience uh, that, they, that they're into, I should design it that. Is it is it as simple as that, or how does it get more yeah, complicated? Yeah, no, I think that's definitely um, that's definitely a fair point. Actually, the first thing I said today, I think, to Jaunty when we stepped off the plane in um, Schiphol Airport was, "Oh, I forgot how everything looks so Dutch designed here." And actually, coming to this conference and looking at the visuals and the wristbands and the tags and everything that we're wearing, this sort of, you know, sans serif, lots of negative space kind of grid-like, very typographic design is 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 kind of, it, to me, it looks very much like Dutch design. Like, you don't see that as much in London, and it's not good or bad. It's just something that comes from a certain group of designers working together in a certain space. So, yeah, we definitely get these kinds of pockets of, of um, design culture coming out of certain places. And I think it is definitely important to think about how this translates in a global community. So one example of this is when La Last FM launched in Japan. Um, Apparently, Japanese people like to look at websites with really cramped typography. And so I actually had the country manager for Japan come up to me at the time and say, there's too much white on the pages. You need to get rid of this. The people don't like it. It's too white. And I was like, OK, can we talk about some examples of Japanese websites that are good design over there that people like to use? And yeah, sure enough, it was all just like crammed in there, absolutely no white space at all. And I was like, OK, we can solve a lot of these problems through the typography. And so we got rid of all the line height and just like smashed it in there and they liked it a lot more. So, <laughs> I mean, it's almost like I18N for your visual style, if you will. I think that's a pretty extreme example. Maybe, you know, the, the difference between, um, you know, New York and Amsterdam probably isn't as, as highly contested. But, that, that's yeah. actually a good point. Uh, in, in Asia, on websites, if you notice, uh, they'll take font and, and type and, and fill in every single white space. And, uh, uh, and I can read some of these languages, and I have a very hard time discerning what's going on on the page, but uh, natives, lo local people love that. And uh, so it's a very inter it's almost the, the opposite yeah. of, uh, of sort of a, a, a New York uh, design style guide or even a, like a Scandinavian or Western European mm -hmm. internet design style. Um, what, so can both of you guys give us like the one example in real life in your history of where you really screwed up big time on design? <laughs> And the users, the users responded, and you were like, "Oops! Like bad idea. I learned from it." Oh, sure. Every day, um, a big one. I don't know. Uh, I think maybe there was some things in the relaunch of two. What was it? July two thousand and eight that had a pretty negative reaction. I think a lot of that might have come out of just like, why are you doing this to us again, though? I mean, ultimately, you're always going to have a negative reaction when you launch a design. Like, no one is ever going to say, this is awesome. You updated your website for me to look at. Like, they're never going to say that. You can only gauge how good the design is by the number of negative responses you get. So if you get like five negative responses as opposed to like 500, then you did a good job. But they're always going to be negative because people see it as you coming in and rearranging their personal space. Like, when they look at that, website, you have to remember it's like you're sneaking into their house in the middle of the night and like 
painting it a new color. Like that's how they feel when they load the page the next day, like, ah, what did you do to me? So yeah, I, I don't know. To an extent, it's hard to tell because it's almost always negative, but. Well, what we found is we, we did a relaunch. Uh, High Mission used to be like black, white, and gray, and slightly blue before. It's quite empty, and there was a lot of white space. And we switched it to this slightly more colorful, colorful style and added a lot more social features at the same time. And um, the res we got a ton of response to that. People, hate, like, people hated it. People were going crazy. And we got all, the, all this hate mail, and it was just intense. And um, what we learned from that was two things. So one is, a few things were actually broken in the relaunch, and those things were aggravating people, but they were complaining about the new design instead. So once we're able to fix the actual technical issues in the, in the new version, um, those things went away. And then a few people, what I did was I had this pile of mail in my mailbox that at, at around the time of relaunch that was all really angry and crazy, and I was like, I just can't deal with this now. And then a month later, I wrote back to those people, and they all, all responded with, oh, you know, I used the site a little more, and it's really great. Like, yeah. it's so amazing what, what this new version lets me do. Which, I don't know, it, it was just a really funny answer to get back from me just asking them, hey, well, like, what do you guys think? You know, what, what don't you like? What, what do you think is broken? And instead, they were like, oh, actually, now that I play with more, um, okay. this is awesome. But yeah, people, that was also because we introduced a lot more new features that weren't previously available, too. People generally just don't like new things. Um, I mean, the best way to sort of mitigate that is just test it, test it a lot before you put it out there, but always expect negative feedback. No one's ever going to say thanks for painting this a new color. Cool. One more question. <laughs> Just to make it faster. Thanks. Uh, quick question regarding what people uh, don't like. Uh, is it more design or interface changes w uh, which they don't like, especially when you introduce some new uh, features on the website? So you can leave the same design, for example, but, the cha but change interactions on the website. Well, I mean, I think the, in the, the interface and functionality changes, depending on how severe they are on the site, may affect like a small, passionate, hardcore group of the users, which are also the ones that complain a lot. Where I find that uh, changes in design, everyone notices right away, even if maybe they don't use the site as fully. So I feel like the design stuff definitely gets a lot more responses, unless you just totally break the site somehow, and then, yeah. yeah. I think the best way to get around that is to just try to always release them together. So, I mean, it's going to be confusing if you keep all the same visuals, but you change the user experience so people don't have any, um, they don't know, like there's no communication to them that the user experience has been changed here now. We need to message that to them. And one way to message that to them is through visuals and copy. So if you change some of that at the same time, at least you're giving people a heads up that like, there's a new path over here, you're going to go to a different place. Um, so that would be the way that I would handle that problem. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you. No problem.